this is a bandpass subwoofer enclosure, and for today's adventure, we're gonna learn how to tune one and bust a couple of bandpass myths along the way. What we have here is a subwoofer box with a subwoofer mounted to an internal baffle that divides the box into a sealed and a ported chamber. This is what's known as a fourth order bandpass. At first, it seems kind of strange. If the subwoofer's in the box, how does it make any sound? And that brings us to our first myth. A lot of people believe that the speaker makes the sound and the port or the vent just lets the sound out. What's actually happening here is that the woofer is compressing and decompressing the air in both sides of the enclosure. This causes the air in the port to pump back and forth the same way that a speaker cone would. What you actually hear is the sound made by the vent itself. Ports are nothing but speaker cones made out of air. That's why sometimes we can use a passive radiator instead of a port. If that sounds complicated, it is. Bandpass subwoofers can be very tricky to design and very tricky to build. So why bother? Because these things are efficient. That's just a code word for loud. A bandpass subwoofer has the potential to play a lot louder than a ported subwoofer with the same amount of power. So if loud is what you're going for, a bandpass might be what you need. That is, of course, not an absolute statement. Some subwoofers don't work well in a bandpass enclosure. You've really got to model it in something like WinISD to know for sure. And that brings us to myth number two, and that is the myth that bandpass enclosures sound bad. If your enclosure sounds bad, it's because it was either designed or built improperly. Now, in my opinion, there are two reasons why this myth keeps getting perpetuated. The first reason is that the market is flooded with cheap, low quality, poorly designed bandpass subwoofer enclosures. They all seem to have plexiglass viewing windows that let you see the subwoofers and the plexiglass is always far too small. It's gonna flex, it's gonna sound bad. If you're gonna use plexiglass on your subwoofer enclosure, it's gotta be thick. These things tend to be flashy with a bunch of LED lights and other junk that contribute nothing to the sound. If you're looking for loud and cheap, pick yourself up one of those. I'll give you some links down in the description. The other reason why is we see these enclosures used a lot in competitions where you're trying to get loud and you're not really trying to make it sound good. These aren't music quality competitions. They are sound pressure level or SPL competitions. The goal here is just to get loud. And the best way to do that is to oftentimes build what they call a burp box. This is an enclosure that's designed to play one note really loud and you don't really care about the others because you're just trying to be loud. The reality is that any type of enclosure can sound good if it's got the right driver and the right design and if it's built properly. The challenge is combining those three things together in order to make it sound good. Wouldn't it be nice though if we had a convenient rule of thumb that we could just follow? Something simple and easy to explain that you can find in a quick Google search? It turns out that we do, which brings us to myth number three. The myth of the magic ratio. A little bit of digging around online, you'll find all kinds of people claiming that the magic number is three to one. The vented side of the enclosure needs to be three times as large as the sealed side of the enclosure. And if you do that, you're gonna have an awesome bandpass subwoofer. Whenever I'm trying to figure something out, like the best way to design a particular type of enclosure, I always try to find a credible source. And the best source for designing speakers is this right here. This is the Loudspeaker Design Cookbook, the seventh edition by Vance Dickerson. If you dig through this book, you're gonna find a lot of really complicated formulas and tables and charts, and none of them mention anything about any ratios at all, much less the magic three to one ratio. That's because the three to one ratio is bunk. There is no magic ratio that's gonna give you the best sounding bandpass subwoofer enclosure or any magic ratio that's gonna give you the best no matter what situation enclosure of any type. Where does this myth come from and what's the problem with it? Well, it all boils down to how you define the word best. And I'm gonna show you right now the information you need in order to model the best bandpass subwoofer enclosure. But before we do that, I need to give a shout out to my supporters over on Patreon. These guys right here help me make videos. And in exchange for that, they get all kind of neat perks like early access to videos, special digital downloads, behind the scenes pictures. And I want to give a special shout out to my newest patron, Scott. 
Hey Scott, thanks for joining the team. If you want to find out more about all of that, check the links down in the comments. So here I've got some frequency response functions for a Dayton Audio Reference Series high output subwoofer. This is a really cool driver. It's got this neat black anodized aluminum cone. I really like it a lot. And it's got a great reputation for sound quality. Now I've modeled three different bandpass subwoofer enclosures. What I want you to notice is the very first one. The three to one ratio is the blue line. And what you're gonna notice is that blue line lies above everything else. So this is the loudest of the three that I've modeled here. That is the three to one enclosure. If best means loudest, then a three to one bandpass might be what you're looking for. Comparing this to the two to one box, which is the black line, and then the one to one box, which is the red line, you're gonna notice that the three to one is indeed louder. But the other thing to remember is that as the ported chamber gets larger relative to the sealed chamber, the bandwidth, you know, the pass band, gets smaller. So the trade-off here is, a louder box will cover fewer frequencies, and when the box gets quieter or less efficient, it's gonna cover more frequencies. So from a sound quality standpoint, the three to one enclosure is absolutely terrible. It's not best by any stretch of the imagination. The three to one is a one note wonder. It's just not a sound quality box. If you want sound quality, the one to one box is gonna sound better. But what you'll notice if you look real close at the frequency response in WinISD is that the one-to-one -one box doesn't get very low. That's because this driver is not well suited to a bandpass enclosure. It turns out you can get lower bass or louder bass or some combination of both if you just go with a ported enclosure. So for this particular driver, the hassle of going with a bandpass box is just not worth it. None of them are best. Let me show you some ported response functions so you can see what I'm talking about. The first one is this yellow line right here. The yellow line is gonna be the sound quality enclosure. And it is flat with a very low F3. F3 is the point where the box is down by three decibels. The lower the F3, the lower the box is gonna reach. We call that low end extension. Now consider this green line. This green line is louder than the two to one bandpass box has an F3 that's a whole lot lower, so it's gonna get loud and get low, and overall, it's a lot better box. And what if you just wanna get loud? Take a look at this purple line. This right here is a one-note, wonder-ported box, and as you can see, it gets louder than the three-to-one bandpass box. So there's nothing best about that three-to-one enclosure. It does a crappy job of everything. And a ported box outperforms it in every measure. So don't expect to be able to just throw any subwoofer into any three to one enclosure and get good results. So if you want good results, what should you do? Well, it's really hard to find good information on how to get good results. And unless you're modeling in WinISD, there's just not that much practical guidance on how to design a bandpass enclosure. The best source that I have found has been JL Audio's website. Their website gets a little bit technical, but if you'll keep watching, I'm gonna break it down for you in a way anybody can understand. The first thing you need to know is that the sealed section of the enclosure determines how low the subwoofer will play. Now it's gonna vary for each individual subwoofer, but for any given subwoofer, if you want the box to get lower, the sealed portion has to be larger. But there's always a trade-off, and that trade-off is power handling. As the box gets bigger, the power handling goes down. The air in the box is part of the suspension of the entire subwoofer system. So when the box gets large, there's gonna be less cone control, which means there's gonna be less power handling. So when you're designing this, you have to decide which is more important, the ability to handle a whole lot of power or the ability to play low. This is another reason why bandpass enclosures are popular for SPL builds. If you make that sealed section really small, it can handle a whole lot of power before you blow the woofer. Now this can be a problem because you might never hear any distortion when you put too much power on that driver. In fact, in a lot of SPL builds, they'll invert the subwoofer so that the voice coil is in the ported section. That way they can smell the coils getting hot and know when to turn it down. The ported side determines how loud the subwoofer will play. A big ported side will play very loud, but there is a trade-off. There's always a trade-off, and that trade-off is the pass band. That's kind of how the bandpass subwoofer got its name. It allows part of the bandwidth to pass. 
So as the ported side gets larger, the box gets more efficient so it gets louder, but the passband narrows. And as the ported side gets smaller, the box becomes less efficient so it's quieter and the passband widens. Let's take a closer look at the passband. On the high end of the passband, the high frequency cutoff is called the FH, and on the low end, the low frequency cutoff is called the FL. These are the points where the SPL is down by three decibels. The other big problem with a bandpass enclosure is a thing called the passband ripple. Look right here at these dog ears on either side of the plot. There's a peak at the upper end, a peak at the lower end, and a dip in the middle. If that dip is too large, it's gonna sound bad. The difference between the peaks and the valley tends to increase as the passband widens. So not only are you losing efficiency, you're creating that dip in the middle, and that's not something you want. The third thing you need to know about designing a bandpass enclosure is that the port tuning is counterintuitive. The port tunes the ported chamber, but the port tuning is based on the sealed chamber. You're supposed to tune the port to the center of the passband, and the center of the passband is determined by the resonant frequency of the sealed side of the enclosure. The resonant frequency of the sealed side is determined by the subwoofer's free air resonance, or FS, the stiffness of its suspension, the VAS, and the volume of the air in the sealed side, VB. That stands for volume of box. And it's based on this simple formula right here, where FC stands for center frequency. So you'll tune the port to FC, whatever FC happens to be. If you adjust the volume of the sealed portion of the enclosure, that's gonna change the center frequency, so you've gotta adjust the port accordingly. This is what it looks like if you do it wrong. If you don't tune the port to the center of the passband, you're gonna exaggerate one of the dog ears and flatten out the other. This will sound like utter garbage. To learn more about port tuning, check out these videos right over here. And if you'll hit that subscribe button, I'll see you on the next adventure.